culture's most familiar aliens, and they are known as the Greys. But what do we know about these presumed extraterrestrials? Eyewitnesses swear they have encountered these aliens, and they believe the Greys are here on a diabolical mission, abducting humans and conducting reproductive experiments. This is a very real phenomenon. Something is happening to these people. Who are they? Where are they from? And what do they want? Are they real? It's good to have an open mind. But not so open that your brains fall out. Next on UFO Files, the mystery of the Gray's agenda. The Gray's. They are depicted in books, magazines, and in the movies. They are commonly described as being about four feet tall, with huge bald heads that sit on gray, frail, hairless bodies. These creatures have small noses, or no noses at all, slits for mouths, no ears or visible reproductive organs, and very distinctive eyes. They come to a point not except point, but they just come up like almonds, big almonds. Almost a um, black, dark brown. They're, they're dark. Those who maintain that extraterrestrials do exist often portray Gray as the bad guys of the alien world. The Greys, uh, from what I know, are just like the worker bees. When they come and get you, they come and get you. They took time out of my life and replaced it either with a blank spot or with a scary memory. If there are greys or any other alien species and they're here, what do they really want? What is their agenda? An effort to create an offspring race that perhaps uh, had the best qualities of humanity and the best qualities of these alien beings. Many ufologists, people who routinely research alien sightings, claim that greys have been visiting Earth for thousands of years. Records, they say, exist as petroglyphs, cave drawings, and prehistoric artwork. All around the world, we have these stories of beings coming from the heavens to Earth, star beings, whether it be the Hopi Indians in North America, uh, all these you know, South American cultures, the Mayans, the Aztecs. All around the world, there are these stories of gods visiting ancient man. 6,000-year-old artifacts have been found in what was Samaria, modern-day Iraq. Interpreters of the carvings have said they depict servants or helpers of their god. Many of the artifacts that they've left us resemble what we would call today a modern-day gray alien. Large bulbous head, large eyes, spindly limbs, very thin bodies. Historically, UFOs or aliens go largely unmentioned again until the dawn of the modern era. It is in the 20th century that the Gray's agenda begins to take shape. According to the UFO community, since then and to this day, there has been an obvious and persistent increase in encounters with the Greys. One of the most surprising claims made by some in the UFO community is that during World War II, Hitler and the Nazis were actually in collusion with the Greys. They say the aliens gave the Nazis advanced weapons technology used during the war. Since the Second World War, literally hundreds of people have claimed experiences with the gray alien. The number reported, the quality of the reports, the similarities of the reports, and the fact that many of these reports can be substantiated under hypnosis lends very compelling strength to the idea that this is a very real phenomenon. Something is happening to these people. No official record for alien encounters or abductions exists. However, the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington, keeps an unofficial tally of UFO sightings. Their statistics show that the number of sightings have gone from a handful every year in the early part of the 20th century to dozens by the middle of the 20th century and then thousands every year beginning in the 21st century. 
Well, it seems that the whole business about the alien abduction really dates from uh, the Cold War. Uh, back when there were UFOs, unidentified flying objects being spotted, and it was all these international tensions after the Second World War. According to UFO believers, the Greys first made contact through the much-debated 1947 crash in the desert outside Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell story is that a rancher named Mac Brazel came into Roswell and told a story to the newspaper about how he had found some strange debris. And from that incident, the Roswell incident, uh, we've now got an elaborate story that many of the American public think is a story of flying saucer wreckage and perhaps little alien greys whose corpses were scattered about, some of whom may have survived alive and are hidden away at some secret facility. The official U.S. government position? A large spy balloon went down at Roswell, not an alien spaceship. It was part of a secret project designed to detect emissions from Soviet nuclear tests. Ufologists believe otherwise. The Roswell story um, has been debated by a lot of people. But one thing that we know is that something came down about 75 miles north of Roswell Army Airfield in the summer of 1947. This was investigated by the 509th Bomber Unit's chief intelligence officer, who was Captain Jesse Marcel. We know that some of this debris was taken back to the Army Air Base. We know that Marcel and the Army Air Base commander, Colonel Blanchard, thought that this was material from a flying disc. And we know that they thought this because a press release went out immediately announcing that the U.S. Army recovered one of the infamous flying discs that was in the news at that time. In the years since the Roswell incident, advocates argue that all contact between the Greys and the government have been kept top secret. Despite repeated official government denials that a UFO crashed in the New Mexico desert, the stories won't die. Uh, there are now more than 400 individuals on the public record who said, I was there, I picked up pieces, I saw pieces of wreckage, I saw the craft, I saw the bodies. So Roswell is simply a question of belief. Who do you choose to believe? fiction, UFO sightings increased dramatically after the Roswell incident. In the 1950s, movie makers soon seized on these stories, and for the first time, alien creatures appeared invading Earth with an agenda, sometimes evil. Films like The Thing and Plan 9 from Outer Space tapped into the public's fascination and fears of UFOs. The day the Earth stood still warned of terrible consequences if Earth did not press forward into space as a friendly partner. Stories of abduction by an alien race called the Greys soon followed. It was only really until the 1960s that people began to believe that they were actually being abducted themselves by um, beings from other planets. In 1961, a New Hampshire couple became the first people in history to officially report being abducted by the Greys. The Betty and Barney Hill story, of course, is one of the abduction experiences that kind of kicked off the whole abduction phenomenon. When we come back, Betty Hill, in her last on-camera interview, recounts what the Greys did to her and her husband. I didn't know where they were from, but I knew they were not from this planet. The case of Betty and Barney Hill remains the seminal alien abduction tale. It stands as the first ever recorded encounter with the Greys the most popularly noted alien species said to visit the Earth. It allegedly occurred near Portsmouth, New Hampshire on September 19, 1961. To this day, skeptics cannot dispute every detail of the story. Believers see the Hills incident as the defining moment in gray history when the nation and the world awoke to the troubling phenomenon of alien abduction.
In her last on-camera interview, the late Betty Hill shared her experience. My husband Bonnie and I are returning from Montreal, Canada. We're traveling down through the White Mountains of New Hampshire when we suddenly spot what we thought was a new star in the sky. And as we watched this, it changed direction and came in towards us. Barney pulled over, grabbed a pair of binoculars, and stepped out of the car to get a closer look at the menacing flying object. Betty Hill's niece, Kathy Martin, was a teenager when this incident occurred. At that time, through the binoculars, he saw the leader, what he called the leader, and crew members. There were people looking down at him. And as he's watching, it began to descend. And at this point, he became frightened, ran back to the car, yelling that they were trying to capture us. She was screaming to him, Barney, you damn fool, come back here, get back here. They sped off. A short while later, they heard a buzzing sound. They turned onto a logging road and stopped. There was a roadblock and there were people in the road. The people approached the car and they realized at that point that they were not human. That they were the people that Barney had seen in the UFO. This is where their memory lapsed. The next thing they fully consciously remembered was they were driving down the highway again and they proceeded home. When the Hills noticed the time, they realized that about two hours had elapsed that neither of them could account for. That was just the beginning of a mystery that would soon unravel. For nearly two years after their experience, the Hills had troubling nightmares. They went to several medical specialists and eventually were referred to Dr. Benjamin Simon, a highly respected Boston psychiatrist and neurologist with an extensive background in hypnotic therapy. Dr. Simon told us these UFO people had caused us to have amnesia. And Dr. Simon removed the amnesia so that we could remember clearly all that had happened. They took us on board the craft, their craft, and we were taken into separate rooms. They were very human looking. They had two arms, two legs. The only difference basically were their facial features. The noses were very, very small. Almost no nose. Small lips, small nose. They examined my eyes, ears, nose, throat, skin, hair, and all. And then I was put on a table where they scraped my skin in an attempt to find out if our skin was alike or different. Hill says an alien conducted sexual experiments on them. They took semen from Barney. Betty may have had eggs extracted. He tried to insert a needle-like instrument in my navel, which caused pain, so he stopped doing it. And I was grateful for that. Years later, Betty Hill produced the first alleged eyewitness depiction of the Greys since ancient drawings and carvings. They portrayed the alien leader, who showed her a tantalizing clue to indicate where they came from. I asked him where he was from, and he showed me a star map. In a hypnotic
hypnotherapy session a few years after her encounter, Betty drew a map of an alien star system. At the time, experts could not identify it. But then in 1966, Marjorie Fish, an enterprising ufologist and amateur astronomer, became fascinated by Betty Hill's star map. Fish spent the next seven years examining the map and constructing models, trying to match it to a known star system. It was only later, when a new star was discovered, that they found exactly what Betty had drawn on the star map. In 1973, after reviewing 23 star models, Marjorie Fish claimed to have found a fit. She declared that Betty Hill had drawn a star system some 40 light years from Earth, Zeta Reticuli. At the California Institute of Technology, Dr. Charles Beichmann, one of the world's foremost astronomers, examines Zeta Reticuli. We have no way that to possibly travel that far. We don't know of any way for any solid vehicle to go that sort of a distance. But relatively speaking, within the scale of the galaxy, it's a very nearby star. In a conventional Earth-based space shuttle, it would take nearly a million and a half years to reach Zeta Reticuli. In addition to his duties with the California Institute of Technology and the Jet Propulsion Lab, Dr. Beichmann is a leading member of NASA's Origins program. Their mission is to probe space for signs of life. He concedes that life is possible in the universe, maybe even on Zeta Reticuli. Here we're looking at the two stars in the Zeta Reticulum system, about 40 light years away. The binary stars could well have planets around stars like this. The system is old enough that in fact you could have a stable life having evolved on any habitable planets in those systems. Again, prospects good. What do we know today? Nothing. With just tantalizing evidence, but no definitive proof that the greys actually come from Zeta Reticuli, Betty Hill's case continues to be hotly debated. However, skeptics and believers can agree that since that night in September 1961, hundreds of alien abductions have been reported. Just as a disease is contagious, so can an idea be contagious and, and, and spread from person to person. Did Betty Hill really meet aliens from Zeta Reticuli? Did they conduct reproductive experiments as part of an evil agenda? Are the people claiming to have been abducted reporting the truth? They're dreaming with their eyes open. So they have these hypnopompic, or upon awakening, hallucinations. That's the tactile sensations, the lights, the buzzing, and, the, and especially the sense of presence. So many times the debunkers try to explain abductions as people simply mimicking and repeating stories that have been passed around over the years. Well, here's some people who had nothing to go by. <laughs> Nobody had ever reported this, and yet their abduction experience is remarkably similar to what we hear from people even to this very day. When UFO Files returns, charges that the U.S. government is conspiring to keep the true nature of the Gray's agenda from the public. When the Betty and Barney Hill abduction story broke in the 1960s and was soon followed by many more, the general public became entranced with the idea that alien spaceships were visiting Earth and that extraterrestrials, known as the Greys, were abducting humans. But in 1969, the U.S. Air Force dismissed the accounts in an investigation codenamed Project Blue Book. The report concluded UFOs constituted no direct threat to the United States and reports of unidentified flying objects were the result of a mild form of mass hysteria or, quote, war nerves, hoaxers, publicity seekers, psychopathological persons, and the misidentification of various conventional objects. There is nothing in the records which would indicate that we have been visited by any advanced civilization. 
With that, the U.S. Air Force declared the case closed. However, ufologists were not swayed by Project Blue Book then, and many still believe that the U.S. government has been involved in a cover-up of cosmic proportions since the Roswell case. It really has to be said that Blue Book was nothing more than a PR effort by the Air Force uh, to explain away UFO phenomenon. I think early on in the 40s and 50s when they began to learn, they meaning the government, that uh, UFOs, extraterrestrials were probably a reality. I think it scared them to death because number one, they feared public panic, disruption of the social systems, religious systems. And they were loath to admit that they could not control the skies over the nation. And try as the Air Force might to debunk UFOs again and again through the 50s and 60s, Whoever's operating these UFOs didn't appear to read the Air Force reports because they kept showing up. Ufologists argue that Project Blue Book cannot account for a large number of cases. Out of 12,618 UFO reports, 701 remain unsolved. One of the most intriguing unsolved cases took place at Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico in 1964. According to the story, an alien spaceship landed at the base. Several greys emerged and were greeted by U.S. military personnel. It later became the basis for the famous closing sequence in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This is absolutely, I mean, something we cannot confirm. However, it has to be said that a rumor of this came out immediately. An airman at Holloman Air Force Base who went into the, the, the town and started talking about this. And uh, according to the accounts, he was highly distressed, uh, very upset, didn't know what to do. And he was not seen again. 1984, two mysterious film canisters appeared, which would help perpetuate the claims of conspiracy theorists. Jamie Chandray in 1984 received this package in the mail, which was undeveloped film. There were two sets of undeveloped film. One was given to Bill Moore and one was given to Jamie. And uh, he, in turn, released this to the world and, and it was an eight-page memo signed by Harry Truman. Known as the Majestic 12 or MJ-12 documents, they suggested that on July 9, 1947, President Harry S. Truman appointed 12 high-ranking military and national security personnel and authorized them to conduct a covert mission a top-secret research and development intelligence operation responsible directly and only to the President of the United States. The large number of documents that I've been able to accumulate very clearly show that we have a covert program to keep from the public the recovery of a large number of crashes that include the recovery of extraterrestrials. The Majestic 12 documents detail four types of spacecraft that the aliens use. They include disc, cigar, circular, and triangular shaped crafts. But most intriguingly of all, within the pages of the MJ-12 documents, there is, for the first time in history, acknowledgement of alien beings that are known as the Greys. In these official-looking papers, they are called Extraterrestrial Biological Entities, EBEs. There was a special operations manual uh, called Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal. And in that manual, there was a one-page description of two different types of extraterrestrial biological entities. EBE Type 1 is said to be, quote, humanoid and might be mistaken for human beings. They are bipedal, 5 to 5 feet 4 inches in height, and weigh 80 to 100 pounds. Cranium is somewhat larger and more rounded. The eyes are small, wide-set, almond-shaped. EBE type 2 is said to be, quote, 3 feet 5 inches to 4 feet 2 inches and weighs 25 to 50 pounds. Skeptics, however, claim that the MJ-12 documents are an elaborate hoax. These were bogus. These were uh, 
uh, dummied up documents somebody made using an old typewriter and uh, finding a signature off of a genuine uh, Truman document and cutting and pasting and re-photocopying. And they're uh, obvious and provable uh, forgeries and fakes. If these are faked, it is what you call an inside job, and that is a government job. Uh, someone who had access to information that was restricted at the very least. Even more mysterious papers emerged in the 1980s with riveting new details about the Greys. The Dulcy Papers, perhaps, were the most sensational. Released in 1987, they allege that the U.S. government is actually in collusion with the Greys in exchange for highly advanced technology. These unsubstantiated documents allege there is an underground facility somewhere in the New Mexico desert where the Greys are secretly enacting their evil agenda. They're using us for breeding because they have fertility problems. We don't know how they reproduce. We know they don't have genitals. Those who subscribe to this theory say the Greys abduct young pregnant women. Then within the first three months, first trimester, the pregnancy spontaneously just terminates. There's no bleeding, there's no spontaneous abortion, there's no regular abortion, there's none of that. And all of a sudden, it stops. Believers say the extraterrestrials extract the unborn child from the victims and use them for their alien-human hybrid program. These fetuses, if you will, are somehow kept uh, by the ETs in usually these tanks, we call them. They're kept in fluid, and then they're, they're somehow raised to be adults. The release of these and other documents, coupled with new sightings, fueled the public's appetite for more information. People alerted to the phenomenon looked to the skies for signs of mysterious crafts and beings from an alien planet. There's no question that the UFO research field really exploded during the 1980s. It, it's an amazing phenomenon. You have, uh, for the first time, widespread discussion of abductions. Uh, at the same time, the UFO phenomenon became a major part of U.S. popular culture, world popular culture at that time. It is very much debatable, but some say the term gray was first used in the 1980s to describe the extraterrestrials that are abducting humans and conducting reproductive experiments. The term itself, gray, used to describe these beings, uh, seems to have become more common by the uh, early and mid-1980s. I don't believe that it was uh, common before that period of time. But do the Greys actually exist, or are they, in reality, a product of pop culture? The question arises, you know, what happened, and to what extent does uh, life imitate art or, or the reverse? It's hard to unsort some of this mess. It's my belief that there is a true core of reality to the UFO phenomenon. Ufologists insist that the Earth may be in the midst of a diabolical invasion of greys. When we come back, we uncover the true horror of the greys' agenda. They have an ongoing breeding program. It was about eight weeks pregnant. Then it was just gone. As the 21st century unfolds, the numbers of alleged gray alien abductions, according to members of the UFO community, are rising. There is no way to verify these numbers, but one unofficial poll conducted by the Roper organization puts the number of alien abductions at 4 million. I think that the problem a lot of people have with the greys in general is that they don't believe in UFOs to start with, so therefore they're not going to believe in something like abductions. But if you were to acknowledge the reality of UFOs as something non-human, suddenly the reality of something like greys is not all that outrageous, it seems to me. 
Eyewitnesses who swear they have encountered greys are the primary source for all the information about these extraterrestrials. They report some commonalities that may reveal the true nature of the aliens' agenda. There's always a, a light that comes from nowhere. Um, it's either uh, like an amber or a blue. Then the frightened abductees report being surrounded and paralyzed by the alien creatures. They're not just making you immobile. They put you almost in like a comatose state. I've had occasions where I've been able to communicate with them to an extent, uh, which is a mixture of them speaking in a sense that seems to be telepathic. Some even claim the Greys will often whisk their human prize away into space. And you find yourself in, uh, for lack of a better word, an alien environment where there's lots of light, everything is very... Poetic is almost the word to use to describe the environment because it feels very surreal. Abductees say that once on board, the Greys perform medical examinations, which some describe as being extremely painful. There were experiences which to me suggested that there was a biological reproductive element of my experiences, and, and that's commonly widespread. So I'm not, uh, I'm not ashamed in, in reporting that. If the Greys are actually here, What's their real agenda? A lot of people think that they're coming to totally destroy us. And some people think that, and some people think that there are others coming to help us not be destroyed. Hypnotherapist and self-proclaimed alien hunter, Daryl Sims, has been studying the abduction phenomenon for more than 30 years and believes he has uncovered the Gray's true mission. He specializes in recovering repressed traumatic memories from people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. One of the things you would do in the beginning with these people is to relax them completely and the tone of my voice changes totally. Just focus on the sound of my voice. You'll find the sound of my voice causing your eyes to get heavier. The sound of my voice will comfort you. It'll protect you. And it's okay for you to relax completely. One of his clients, Donna Lee, is the president of the Houston UFO Network. She believes she has been abducted many times by the Greys. In the course of hypnotherapy sessions with Daryl Sims, she has recalled numerous terrifying encounters. She even believes the Greys took her unborn child. I never had anything involved that would have been a miscarriage. I was about eight weeks pregnant. Um, then it was just gone. I did not have the bleeding that's involved. Nothing. In a later regression session, Lee recalled being in a brightly lit, sterile room. They brought a young girl into the room and left her there with me. And she was a hybrid, what we consider a hybrid, although she looked a lot like me. Her hair was, she had really bad hair though. But she looked a lot like me. And I, she was about the age that my child would have been at that point. Lee claims the hybrid child was about nine years old. She sat there. I had that realization in that moment when they left me there with her and she looked at me that I know you. And it was this very sad, almost overwhelming sadness. For a while, I would still recall that longing for that again. To many experts, accounts of alien abductions are merely a product of an overactive mind. They say under hypnosis, subjects are open to suggestions. What happens under hypnosis 
is that people will generate imagery that they will often mistake for memories of things that actually happen rather than things that they're just producing. Second point is that when people recover these sorts of quote unquote memories under these regression hypnotic regression sessions, they tend to credit them as being true. When we return, the results of a Harvard University study conducted by a team of psychologists surprises skeptics, angers believers, and sparks a controversial debate. To write them off as fantasy is a dire mistake. Are the earnest memories of abductees real or imagined? They come and, without permission, they touch your body. They take your children. You want to scream, but, I mean, my mouth is open and nothing has come out. It's paralysis, but walking paralysis. Do the greys exist? And if so, are they on a devious mission? In 2003, a team of psychologists from Harvard University believe they found the answer. Led by Dr. Richard J. McNally, they conducted a unique experiment to measure the physiological responses, like heart rate and perspiration levels, of various types of trauma victims. We wanted to see whether People who've recovered memories of space alien abduction would show the same reactions, post-traumatic-like reactions, as do real trauma patients. Our research group has been studying people with um, uh, recovered memories of traumatic events. And one of the big challenges that we've had is distinguishing between those individuals who've recovered memories of, for example, childhood sexual abuse, or actually genuine memories, versus memories that were perhaps false memories. Dr. Scott Orr directed the lab tests. What this procedure involves is an individual coming in to the lab, sitting down with one of our counselors, and then describing a variety of experiences that they've had. We wire them up with recording electrodes so we can measure heart rate and skin conductance and facial EMG. In the lab, test subjects then listen to a 30-second audio tape of their own traumatic or abduction experience. You are lying naked, strapped to a metal table in a spaceship. There are alien beings hovering over the table. They are staring at you with their large, dead, black eyes. You are absolutely terrified. Then they open their eyes and they make self-reports of emotional experiences that they had while imagining the scene. So we ask them to rate how much arousal they felt, how vivid the scene was for them how in control they felt, uh, how pleasant or unpleasant they felt, how much fear, how much sadness, a, a variety of different emotional experiences. The Harvard psychologists found that the alien abductees exhibited a high tendency of a personality trait called absorption. Absorption is this ability to generate vivid imagery. When you go to the movie, you become moved by it emotionally. When you read a novel, it comes alive before your eyes. You become entranced by a sunset. You become lost in daydreaming and fantasy. They're especially high on this, and this is related to the ability to generate rich and realistic imagery. The study further concluded that in most cases, the abductees are not lying. They really genuinely believe that the alien narrative accounts for the experiences that they've had, that they're sincere. They're not quote unquote crazy. Now these particular events are sleep paralysis episodes. These things are really normal events, they don't indicate pathology. But what happens during rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, 
the stage of sleep when we do most of our dreaming, we're entirely paralyzed. When you combine all of these things together, you have yourself a space alien and duck team. However, a former McNally test subject believes the Harvard study is fatally flawed. It might be that alien encounters do involve an altered state of consciousness, but to write them off as fantasy, I think is a dire mistake, and that's where he goes wrong. I myself have had sleep paralysis. Uh, I know that the sensations are superficially similar to that of alien contact. Although there are similarities, it doesn't go far enough to account for it. But if Boucher and his fellow abductees are right, and the greys really do exist, then they must come to Earth from somewhere. If not from Zeta Reticuli, then where? It's a 2,500-year-old question. It goes back to the ancient Greeks who asked, is there life beyond the Earth? And now we're bringing the tools of 21st century science and technology to answer what simply is a very old question. There ought to be one, ten, a hundred, or a million intelligent civilizations out there for us to be talking with. People who claim to have been abducted believe that intelligent alien life forms not only exist, but are already here. And they have crossed the cosmos with a purpose. I think the Grey's agenda is to make a better future for their children. I think it's that simple. And I think that part of that agenda entails also ensuring that humanity is also going to continue. I think it's a mutually beneficial agenda. Psychologists maintain, however, that the alien phenomenon is a product of overactive imaginations. The greys, in my view, are, are in fact hypnopompic visual hallucinations that occur when people are arising out of a sleep paralysis episode. And their purpose for coming to Earth? They don't have one. They're hallucinations. It's good to have an open mind. But not so open that your brains fall out. Is the Grey's agenda real or imagined? Alien abduction? Fact or fiction? It's still a mystery just like most abductions. They're never going to tell you why they're here or who they are or why they do what they do. Is it possible that ETs exist? I think they're here. And they've been here for a long time.